Wow, I am super impressed that Daredevil Season 2 was able to keep the surprise ending of this episode under wraps. I mean, that is pretty spectacular. And also, shockingly, nobody ruined it on the internet either. People told me, you guys told me a big reveal was coming at the end of Episode 8, but I was like... I'm, I'm ready, Nobu. Time for you to show up, as I predicted from the trailer. Uh, but I did. I only saw this coming uh, with the appearance of Wilson Fisk as he was walking through the prison. And we'll talk about it in detail because, of course, that's the number one thing on the best list. Uh, and I thought the number one thing was going to be that awesome, honest-to-God ninja that showed up. I was like, this is all about the ninja. Woohoo! And then, of course, Wilson Fisk shot to the top of the list. There is a worse list because I didn't like some of the developments, so this episode doesn't have the honor of having a uh, no worse list, uh, but the best list. Oh, it's so chock full of awesomeness. I'd also like to say before we get started that I thought the theme of this episode was you know nothing, Matt Murdock, uh, because that seemed to be what everybody was saying to him. I also, and I didn't have anywhere to put it, so I wanted to just talk about it here, is I thought it was, you know, hilarious, and I, I think I would like to, I would have liked some character to comment on it, that it's a good thing that Matt Murdock is blind, because he didn't see those horrifying black veins creeping up Electra's face. He, I mean, like, he had no idea how bad it was. So I thought, I thought that was pretty uh, hilarious. All right, so let's get started. So obviously... The number one best thing of the episode was the appearance of Wilson Fisk. Wow! And they were able to get away with it because they said special guest star so they didn't have to include him in their cast lists. That was just so... What a coup. What a coup. Uh, and of course, who isn't happy to see Vincent D'Onofrio return? You can't really tell a Daredevil story, I think, without uh, Wilson Fisk's involvement somewhere, right? I mean, this is episode eight. He only showed up at the end. So Daredevil's had his time to play on his own. Uh, I am very curious, though. What, what, could, what could the message have been that would get Frank Castle to talk to someone who was largely considered a criminal himself, right? I mean, Frank Castle's supposed to hate those guys. So I'm curious as well to hear uh, Wilson Fisk's pitch. But also, you know, I, I, I thought it was, as I said in my open, I thought that it was uh, Kingpin when they started to walk through the prison. I was like, is this Wilson Fisk? Oh, I hope it is. Uh, and, you know, I was like, are they really going to do that? Like, I was on the edge of my seat, and then, bam, they did. So it was a really good reveal. And I love that he was working out. Because in the comics... Uh, Wilson Fisk, a.k.a. the Kingpin, is a physically strong individual. But of course, you know, while he had elements of that, uh, you know, in the first season, I think he's, he was, I think one of the things we like so much about this depiction of the Kingpin is his vulnerability and his lack of uh, self-confidence. I, mean, I think that's, you know, really key to what makes, uh, suddenly makes his character so complex in this uh, version of him, which I would like to see reflected in the comics. So we're going to be talking about the comics a little bit later with the Punisher. Uh, but so I liked him, you know, I'm sure he still has those insecurities, but I'm sure he's also grown a lot in prison. Uh, prison, the best self-confidence builder there is. Uh, so I, I mean... <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to see that. I also like bringing prison more into this franchise, and by that I mean the Marvel Netflix shows. You're talking about characters that fight justice. There's a lot of the legal system in there and the police, because Jessica Jones, of course, is a private investigator. Luke Cage gets his origin story in prison. So I'm glad to see this start to become a part of the show. Uh, Orange is the New Black is no longer the only prison-centric show or series on Netflix. Uh, and so I also wondered if that guard who was, uh, you know, har uh, harassing but actually delivering Frank Castle, uh, if that was the guard who harasses Luke Cage and his origin story. I could I don't think his name tag said Rackham, which is the name of that guard. Uh, and also Luke Cage's story happened earlier, of course. You know, it's going to have to ha we're going to have to see it in flashbacks. But who knows? Uh, but this isn't the this isn't the last abuse of prison guard or sketchy prison guard you're going to see in uh, on Marvel Netflix. All right, so that's number 1. So good. Number 2. The hand. The ninja gets second place, but second place ain't bad. And that ninja was awesome. That was 110% ninja action. That ninja had throwing stars, that ninja had um, uh, a sword, and that ninja had arrows. That ninja was awesome. And I love that it's such a great foe for uh, Daredevil because he can't hear the heartbeat. And now, uh, I don't want to give anything away, but if you know the history of the hand, you know why there's no heartbeat. So I thought that was really cool. I hope that Electra maybe uh, explains that to him in her defense. But anyway, I thought that was so great. Like the look on Matt Murdock's face when he took an arrow through the back. Oh, it's fantastic. And they did that pupil uh, situation. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure he was poisoned. I don't think they should have sent stick home. I hope Electra knows that recipe because uh, I can't imagine that all their weapons wouldn't be laced with that poison. But that was like super 
super awesome. So I love the vulnerability action. I love the mark on the wall I have in my notes here. Like if Matt Murdock survives this, that is an awesome souvenir. You'd be like, see this mark on the wall? Ninja attack. He's got scars on his body and on his apartment. So I thought that was really, really good. Uh, then next, three, best, th uh, third best thing in the episode, Electra kills. I, you know, obviously killing is horrible. I agree with Matt Murdock, the God and the justice system are the ones that make that decision and self-defense. But I thought, I think that Electra is an assassin. That's a really important part of her persona. That's one of the things that makes her relationship with Matt Murdock, AKA Daredevil, so tumultuous. And you can't ignore that. I have major problems with Electra from this episode, which we will discuss on the worst list. And they stem a little bit from her being so apologetic over killing someone. I mean, I think they robbed her of a lot of owning that moment. She, you know, it was a little bit fatal attraction where she was like, this is who I am, Matt. Do you still want me? I'd be like, come on, Electra, have some self-respect. This is the best list. Let's focus on what was so awesome about Electra this episode. Uh, so I really, oh, also, I thought it was funny that one episode, Matt's uh, love life had an embarrassment of riches, and then it all was shot to hell in this episode. <laughs> so it's like, he jinxed it, though, when they were in the bedroom when he was with Electra, and he was like, I'm so happy we can finally be together. I was like, jinx, 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 jinx. And that was, you know, I knew there was a ninja waiting outside, but still, he should have known he was jinxing it. But I love the line uh, that she said to him uh, when she, Electra's got a lot of good lines. When she said to him, I'm, you have such a light in you, I'm glad I failed to snuff it out in college. I was like, wow, Electra, you are so good at getting guys to like you. This is amazing. I mean, she is just like, she's good with a blade and she's uh, good with a line. So I, I thought that was really impressive. So I, I liked that quite a bit. But we have more to talk about Electra on the worst list. So, but I, I liked some of the development of her character during this episode. And Elodie Young, I mean, she can't help what she's being, what she's given in terms of character development, but I think she, what she's been asked to do, she has done, just been an absolute pro in every, in every regard. And I love her character. Uh, flaws and all. Then the fourth thing I liked about the episode is the legend of the Punisher. Oh, it's so good. It's so, well, let me walk, let me walk through the episode. So basically, I thought the general testimony, the general's testimony at the beginning was great. The way he told that story about what Frank Castle did and why he got his commendation. And he said, the, and the, you know, the DA or, you know, um, I forget who asked him, but they were like, why do you think he was able to do this? And the general was like, because he's Frank Castle. And I was like, he is, because he is Frank Castle. And I love the reveal that he was the one who got them all, you know, that general was the one who was injured and got everyone in harm's way. That was fantastic, because apparently he's got a fake arm, and that's why you couldn't tell it was him. But that was a good fake out. They got the DA good. That was excellent. <clears throat> I also really liked Frank's unwillingness to accept pretty compelling evidence as to why he is the way he is. He was like, that's not true. And I'm like, I don't know, Frank, you should take this pretty seriously because this brain injury and how you're reliving the moment of loss and, you know, robs you of your rational thought is pretty awesome. I liked it because it made the idea of the Punisher more sympathetic. You know, like he's not just a crazed guy looking for revenge. He is like, he's been tossed into his own private hell. And I think it makes the character much more sympathetic to see him struggling with that mental problem. So I really liked that a lot. I thought that was fantastic. Uh, but he won't accept it, which I also think is very true to the character. I also like that he was touched by the guilt over that uh, teenager saying, you took my father from me. I mean, let's be honest, Frank Castle only kills uh, criminals. So that guy's father took a lot of other people's fathers away too. So I think it's like, you know, an eye for an eye, that whole dilemma. So like everyone's a little bit at fault, but I like that Frank, you know, that kind of like sent him a little over the edge. I thought that was good. It also adds to his sympathy. But I have to say, when John Bernthal walked into the courtroom dressed in a suit to testify, he was the Punisher to me. When he came in the room, I was like, that's the Punisher. They've done it. They've made the connection for me. And I, I said we were going to talk about the comics again, and I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see John Bernthal, uh, you know, the illustrations in the comics look a little bit like him, because I think this is a very, very good uh, depiction of the character. <clears throat> I also loved when he embraced the Punisher name on the stand. He's like, you call me the Punisher? I am the Punisher. And I was like... Move over, Jack Nicholson. You can't handle the truth. This is darn good testimony as well. Loved it. All right, so the fifth thing I liked about the episode is I have to give it to Karen. See, Karen, we, know we all have a love-hate relationship with Karen, and I think Matt Murdock does too. But she goes back and forth between the worst and the best list. And I put her on the best list this, for this episode because I really felt bad for her. I think that she really was right. You know, there's no explanation that's going to be satisfactory for all the lies that Matt has told, all the things he's kept her out of, and finding another woman in his bed, you know, in a state of undress, and Matt, like, 
it's in a somewhat intimate, you know, you could feel the you could feel the vibes between them. It was really embarrassing for her. I, I think that Matt shouldn't have given her a key. I was like, why does she have a key? You haven't been dating for that long. <clears throat> I'm sure Karen like pocketed it or, or, you know, this is, I think the bad, this is exactly what I said would happen when sometimes you're too aggressive and you push a relationship from either side, uh, men or women, either side of a relationship or, you know, men and men, women and women, you know, from, from the two people, if you push something, you might get the other person to temporarily say, okay, I'll try it. But if you push it that hard like Karen has, this, I think this is usually what happens. And so, you know, she insisted on pushing this relationship forward too fast. You know, she insisted, I guess, on having a key. You know, she insists on always coming over and telling him. She's like, I'm going to tell Matt. I'm going to, you know, I'm gonna always going to be the one who goes to run to Matt. And I'm going to always be the one who makes more of an effort in this relationship. And then smack, well, she, she ran right into this. And so, But I feel, I still, even though I feel she's very culpable in what happened, I feel that I still feel very bad for her. I think, you know, Matt shouldn't have done that to her. I think it was cruel. So she has to go on the best list. And I also think that uh, um, the actress, Deborah Ann Wool, did a very good job. I mean, to her credit, Karen's a difficult character to play, and I think she does a very good job. All right, so let's move to the worst list. Number one, I absolutely hate that Stick trained Electra. I hate it so much. It's so problematic for me. If I had like a red pen and I was again editing this before it went to, to, to be shot, I would X this thing out like crazy. I'd be like, I don't care how it ties everything together. I don't care that it explains her college behavior, but I do appreciate that. But the problem with it is, is that it robs Electra of owning her own movements and actions. She now becomes a pawn. She becomes a tug of war between Stick <clears throat> and, and Matt Murdock. And I mean, it, literally, you know, M Matt made a play say, come fight with me. And Stick's like, stay and fight with me. And I'm like, Electra's supposed to be her own player in this game. And they, they robbed her of that. <clears throat> so I, I really, it really bothered me considerably. And I hate that they did that to the character. And they do it a lot with female characters. And I, one of the things I was excited about with Electra is that she was like, gonna own her own stuff and be like a major player in this universe. I'm glad they haven't done it with Jessica Jones, but I think this really brought Electra down a peg and I really hated it. All right, then next, worst, second worst thing, Stick. You know, at the end of the day, Stick always looks cool when he shows up. Like when he showed up in the beginning, I was like, that's awesome, he looks so cool. Look at him take out those ninjas. You know, and how sinewy, uh, you know, Scott Glenn is. I was like, that's pretty awesome. But I have to agree with Matt Murdock. He's super annoying, super, super annoying. I think he's disrespectful. I think he never has uh, enough answers. I think he always gives them too late. Uh, forget on a need to know basis. It's an, uh, a to stick want you to know basis. And I, I just, and also his flashback story for the hand. I was like, come on, Netflix. Can you at least pay for some kind of flashback sequence, be it live action or animated or just drawings that you pan over slowly? I mean, I just, I just didn't appreciate it, especially because I think it's coming from a character that's so unlikable. So I don't like Stick at all. Not a fan. Uh, although I am curious as to who his driver is and, of course, who he's going to get. Uh, so he said, I'm tired of these amateurs. So we'll see. We'll see who he thinks is a professional. All right, then the fourth thing that I didn't like about the episode uh, was Foggy. Can't believe, you know, Foggy's been on fire this whole season, but I was really disappointed in him and I've just had enough and I wish someone would call him on it. You know, he's yelling at everybody else. I'd be like, Foggy! You know, I said it SJW, SJW, I use that term, which is new to me as well. This is a new term on the internet, uh, the internets, which is a social justice warrior. And that's kind of what the, the firm of Nelson and uh, Murdoch is. They are uh, a social justice warrior law firm. But you can't be a fair weather social justice warrior. And I think that's what Foggy has turned into. Either he wants to represent the people who are being wronged or he doesn't. And Frank Castle was being wronged. You know, he was being railroaded, and especially with this compelling evidence about the brain injury and what happened to his family, that Foggy feels no compassion for him, I think is extremely disappointing. And hasn't, I feel, really made a huge effort with this case. So I was very upset about that, especially because I think Nelson and Murdoch has done so well up until this point legally. And so I was just very disappointed to see Foggy just really not making an effort here. And somebody should say something to him about it. Then, this was not a good episode for Nelson and Murdoch because I thought that Matt, when he interrogated Frank on the stand or questioned him on the stand, did a very poor job. I don't know what uh, saying the, a witness is hostile means. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I would, be, I would be surprised if it meant just go off and make a speech on your own without any interaction with the witness whatsoever. <clears throat> and I was surprised that the judge allowed it. I was like, does the judge know that we're on a television show? And I didn't think that Matt Murdoch's comments were compelling. 
I wish that he had actually questioned Frank. And I also think there was a huge missed opportunity for Frank to realize that this was Daredevil. I thought it was going to happen when he brought up Hope, when Matt Murdock brought up Hope in his uh, comments. But <clears throat> I was very, very uh, upset. Also, I would like to also point out here that uh, witness tampering has been a huge problem in this case. And after the medical examiner, which I think lessened Frank's reveal a little bit at the end, uh, you know, when he said, I, I have something to say, I'd be like, someone else has something to say? We don't even need to ask these people questions. Everyone has their own prepared statements as a witness because they've been harassed by somebody when they were not in court. And I just, I can't believe they can't declare a mistrial after these two situations. I also would like to say something else. I know I was going to pull stills for this uh, episode, to, for the for this review. And uh, Charlie Cox, when the guard, the guard had said something, remember, and he heard it to uh, the Punisher, to Frank Castle, You'll notice that, for, uh, to, that Matt Murdock turns around to look at the guard and be like, I know it was a funny look and that's why it stood out to me on Charlie Cox's face. He's like, huh, what, what? But you don't look, Matt. You have no eyes. You look with your ears. You, you know, like that's how, you know, so I thought that was like a weird choice um, creatively. And finally, this was a very good episode. So, well, you know, I have mixed feelings obviously about it, but I obviously lean toward fantastic. But I had to fill this uh, wor top worst five. So I thought finally I would bring up something that's been bothering me throughout the entire season and season one of Daredevil and then it's so freaking dark. I mean the cinematography is ridiculous. I lighten these stills so that you can see what's going on in them. And as you can see here, this is the same still as one of these other stills but not lightened. And that's how dark it is. It's ridiculous. I, I you know we can see Daredevil team, you know, we're not Matt Murdock. And so I just don't understand. I mean, I can understand you maybe wanting to hide some of the budget, pro you know, uh, restrictions. It is, you know, Hell's Kitchen, and you know, that is the look of the show. But still, sometimes it's so dark that I just, I, I just can't see anything. And I think that's a little, it's a little bit much. So that's my review of episode eight. Thank you so much for continuing to watch with me. Write your own thoughts down below, and I'll see you soon after the next one.